So again, thank you all so much for joining us for this incredibly important uh, webinar. If one thing we have learned in the past year, year and a half, it's that racial equity, uh, racial equity and health is real. But at the same time, we also know that we have tools that can combat and mitigate it. And so I just wanted to start by opening up the conversation and introducing myself. My name is Dion Hawkins. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of argumentation and advocacy at Boston College. Um, at Emerson College in Boston, I'm sorry, and I am the coalition manager for HIV Racial Justice Now, which is one of the partners facilitating and holding this webinar. Uh, just a couple of quick things before we kind of get things rolling is first is that um, for logistics and kind of housekeeping things, if you could please make sure you all are on mute uh, to make sure there's not any kind of intense disruptions. Uh, to the webinar. We will be having a Q&A at the end. If you would like, please feel free to put your um, question in the chat and we will try our best to kind of compile and get to them. Um, and then kind of before we, we kind of get into the, the meat of the presentation, um, I did want to say that I would love to um, formally dedicate this um, to Marco. A lot of us on this call knew Marco. For those of you that um, do not know of Marco. Um, he was a champion in this movement. Um, and for me, he was um, amazing in helping me transition in this role. Um, and that really just wanted to honor him and his legacy. And the one of the key ways to honor this legacy is to talk about the importance of language justice. Um, and so without further ado, we will get into the presentation and I will turn it over to Jose. Uh oh. Much love, y'all. Uh, mucho amor a todos. Uh, my name is Jose Romero, and today's call uh, does have language justice present, which is so important to Marco, and thank you all for flexing that muscle. Así que la llamada de hoy sí tiene justicia del lenguaje presente, y muchísimas gracias por ejercicar ese músculo con nosotros de hoy. In order to access the interpretation today, and um, we are using a separate telephone line. So what you're gonna do is you can call in to the phone number that I put into the chat. It's 425-436-6374 and enter the code 443-0652 and you'll be good to listen in and participate in Spanish. Así que la llamada de hoy sí tiene interpretación en español disponible. Lo que estamos haciendo para la llamada de hoy para brindar interpretación es que estamos usando una línea telefónica separada. Para poder acceder a la interpretación, les estoy invitando a llamar el número 425-436-6374 y ingrese el código 443-0652. I'm going to go ahead and put that message in the chat again so that folks can see that message. Voy a poner el cementaje de nuevo en la caja de charla. And just a reminder to please speak one person at a time uh, and to speak at a moderate pace so that I can really honor each of your words today. Y no más un recordatorio de por favor hablar una persona a la vez y a un ritmo moderado para poder honrar sus palabras de hoy. Thank you so much and thank you for this conversation. Muchísimas gracias y muchísimas gracias por la conversación. I'll pass you the mic back, Dion, y te paso el tono para atrás, Dion. Thank you so much, uh, Jose. And I, I saw the love in the chat and it's just a testament to how powerful and memorable uh, Marco uh, was. And I don't know why it keeps clicking over like this. Um, my mouse is too sensitive. I have a new mouse. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, what is going on here? There we go. I'm so sorry. I promise this is never happens to me. Okay. So, hey, everybody, uh, just an overview so we can get a good idea of how this is going to work. So we're going to do introductions to the presenters that are going to be leading the conversation today. Intro to HIV Racial Justice Now, Funders Concerned About AIDS. Then we're going to transition to focusing explicitly on the guiding principles, and we'll turn it over to Christine. And then third, um, and perhaps most importantly, is we want to have an interactive and productive Q&A session. Um, this was designed to really get community feedback and input to make sure that the principles meet what the community needs. And then... 
Yep. I, like I said, I am Dion. I formally introduced myself already. I will be moderating, kind of guiding this discussion. Um, and then I will turn it over to my other presenters who will be uh, also talking today. Okay. Can I go on or did you want us to introduce ourselves? Yep. Go right ahead. You can introduce yourself. Okay. Hey, y'all. Uh, Vanita Ray, she, her, hers. I uh, happen to be co-executive director of PWN, but I'm also co-chair of HIV Racial Justice Now, coming to you from Houston. Hi, I'm John Barnes, he, him, his. Uh, I'm the executive director of Funders Concerned About AIDS, and I'm thrilled to be here and want to thank Vanita and everyone at HIV Racial Justice Now for a loving partnership. And I am Christine Campbell, she, her, hers. I am a sole proprietor of CM Consulting and I'm working with um, FCAA facilitating the Racial Justice Working Group. Cool, all right. And then now we are gonna go talk about um, the history of HIV Racial Justice Now. And to help us do that, I will turn it over to my kind of person that I go to all the time, my champion, my rock in the movement. Uh, Anita, it's all you, my friend. Thank you. Our the feeling is mutual, Dion. So um, HIV Racial Justice Now was started in the summer of 2017. We're founded, um, to be honest, Nanakana and Charles Stevens. You don't see Charles there now, but he was in this in the beginning because this isn't the original steering committee, but we, were, we found it because there was a recognition that there was an absence of issues around racial justice and equity in the domestic response. And it wasn't because our forefathers or our foremothers and sisters didn't, didn't have these discussions, but it was not central and integral to um, the uh, US response. And a group of leaders of color got together and decided that we would become that, that we needed to bring, um, build solidarity across communities of color with the goal of advancing true racial equity in the response through political education, intersectional movement building, political advocacy, narrative change, and shifting the ways resources are allocated to and within HIV. Um, what you see on the screen right now is our current steering committee and, uh, and uh, you know, it's our current steering committee with the um, inclusion, I'm gonna keep going, you can go back to of Marco that some of us, you know, started with um, earlier this year, I agreed to be co-chair because it was giving me the chance to work closer with Marco. And there was no way because Marco and I have worked on this for a long time that we could do this without centering Marco. And I have to read something that Marco wrote just so you know how important. And I see some of our steering committee on this call. I see Olivia. I don't see Serge right now, but all of these people are important. But Marco said, my call to white colleagues in the HIV AIDS movement is to decide whether you will continue to embrace the exceptionality framework in your individual activism? Or would you commit to collective organizing? Would you be able to work in settings where sometimes you, you would not have the last word or craft the strategy, pace and tone of the projects? Would you be able to learn how to share political imagination, work and freedom and not be the one in charge? For example, in the work of HIV, AIDS, and immigration, I have yet to experience intersectional justice. My grassroots-led work at times feels invisible or is received with less than an open heart. By embracing racial justice, you must learn how to accept discomfort, take risks, and stand side by side with us. Leaders of color that work with integrity and have a vision to get things done. If you know Marco, I hope you heard Marco in that statement. Next slide. And we honor you, Marco, today. And so one of the first tabs, you can go back, the first things we did after coming together as a steering committee 
in the summer of 2017 in Meeting in New York. I was shocked that they had invited me, you know, these folks who've been doing this. And we came up with something and Olivia Ford, who's on here, one of the primary authors that led us through a process of creating something called the Declaration to Liberation, building a racially just and strategic domestic HIV movement. And we published that declaration right around the year anniversary of a 2016 election as a way to really make a statement that we were going to be here and what we were going to do. And that one, some of the things we said, we wanted to be that voice of racial justice and equity in this movement, that we would provide that TA to folks. We would use this document to lead the charge. We would do everything possible across communities of color to um, create a more just domestic response. Ending the epidemic to us is not possible without, without this. And we believe that racial injustice is the key driver of the epidemic. So we formed in 2017 with a steering committee and here we are in 2021, some years later. And this, the declarations, and you can go to the next slide, have turned up in places you would not imagine. It's being used at tables, H United Public Policy Councils doing work with this. It's being worked on and being used by many all over the country. And I just take my hat out, my heart out to those that work to make this declaration of liberation possible. Um, I'll read a little bit from it as we move forward because in this document, we talked about what racial justice was and there's more than one definition of racial justice. And so we adopted one that we use for this document. Next slide, I think it's there. So racial justice by our definition is the collective practice of people of color and allies to identify dismantle and heal from the many external and internal harms of structural and institutional racism. This practice invites us to collaborate across communities of color in service of dismantling white supremacy and building power. I gotta finish this because it says communities of color pitted against each other is one of the many conditions on which white supremacy depends. We envision a movement premised on solidarity, collaboration, and in coalition. And if you, you know, download our declaration, you'll see that definition in there. And uh, I, I just want to credit to all those steering committee members who made this possible. And this is our letter of love to the community. Next slide. And so our work since that time has been about, you know, pushing forth this racial justice uh, need to be included in the HIV response. And these are five points we included in that declaration of how we get there. And I'm reading this today because it's really important for the work we're doing today because in, in, in influencing the way financial resources are allocated is critical to this. So we... Some of the ways we said we would get there is integrate racial justice in your organizations and political strategies. Center communities most impacted by this in leadership and decision making. We recognize people in power don't want to give up power, but to truly realize this, we must center those most impacted. We have to root our efforts to advance this racial justice lens in accountability to the communities we serve. So accountability above all. Ensure equity, one of the main points of this all today around the allocation of resources. And that's not just money, it's in human, in, in bodies, human beings, material and financial. And then lastly, work to transform and where necessary dismantle institutions that uphold white supremacy and compromise the well-being of communities of other other uh, communities of color, we recognize that to dismantle, you have to rebuild with something. And, and in our work, we are, our effort and our work is to uh, build as we dismantle and we need you all's help in doing that. Next slide. Okay, right before that. And so one of the ways we began to work about dismantling was in reaching out to partners in, I think it was 2018, and, be, and, and talking with John Barnes about how we could help influence what funders do around racial justice. 
Um, I think I'm the one made the call to John. John said, Vanita, you're right. And a partnership was born and we are still doing this work today. We're not finished by any means, but this is a huge component. And I really want to acknowledge uh, John Barnes and his staff's uh, support and leadership of getting us where we are today and beyond. So John, I'll turn this over to you. Thanks, Vanita. Um, and uh, I, I just want to start out by saying a little bit about who and what Funders Concerned About AIDS is, because I'm not sure if everyone on the call knows who we are. We're a Funders Affinity Group, also known as a philanthropy serving organization. And we exist to educate funders about HIV AIDS issues and to try to mobilize resources. And in launching the Racial Justice Working Group, as I say here, what, what we, we're looking to do is work on the one hand with partners like HIV Racial Justice Now, and on the other hand, within broader philanthropy to try and establish racial justice principles, but also to assemble tools and resources to help people implement those principles. Um, so we started out, uh, well, as, as Vanita said, we mentioned, we, we started with Vanita and, and Marco and, and others coming and speaking at one of our summits uh, about the Declaration of Liberation. And, and that was followed by trying to, to get more philanthropic venues to, to host these conversations, which ended up being challenging in a time of COVID. Um, but we decided to take that time during COVID um, when we had less opportunity to go out and and talk with others in philanthropy to really um, put together principles of racial justice for HIV philanthropy. Um, and, and it was our intention that they be informed by and based on the work of HIV racial justice now. And so Vanita has been kind enough to be a part of the working group that, that we established. One of the things that we did, and you can go to the next slide, um, to, to start the conversation, be, because at Funders Concerned About AIDS, um, we use data a lot. We, we collect and code about 7,000 HIV grants, and we code them in various ways. We code them by the country that they go to, by the population that they serve, and by the type of work they're trying to accomplish. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll actually let me come back to the data in just a minute because I see that I've got my slides a bit backwards. So um, as I mentioned, we, we started the, the, the working group in 2020. And I just wanted to say that, that in, addition to, um, in addition to wanting to promote racial justice work, we also wanted to make sure that the resources going to combat HIV and AIDS were deployed um, in an equitable manner. So we decided to do, um, we decided to look at the data and um, let's go on to the next slide. We decided to, to look at FCAA's data about, um, yeah, this one, about um, HIV money in the US. And what we found is that of the 200 million in HIV money that is spent in the US, only about, uh, only about 28, well, 29 million of it was, um, was being used for work in BIPOC communities and only about 8 million in African-American communities. So that was about, 28% of the, of the funding targeting BIPOC communities broadly and 15% um, uh, I think, sorry, I've, I've got my numbers backwards. So 28% of BIPOC, BIPOC funding specifically addressed African-Americans, which was only 4% of total USHIV philanthropy. Sorry, I'm uh, tripping over my numbers a bit there, but Basically, we, we decided that in order to get people's attention, um, we needed to demonstrate that 
that there was a problem. And, and we think that these numbers demonstrate that. Uh, so we shared this with funders. We did an infographic um, that's mentioned here and shared it with funders. And we got a lot of pushback. We got a lot mm -hmm. of funders telling us, we know we're doing better than this. Uh, and what we realized is that there's a gap between what funders intend to do and what ends up happening with the money. Uh, and, and so that's, I think that's part of the work that we need to address here. Um, and, and we also know that, that there are real limits to our data. We know, for example, that, that this is talking about money for service in BIPOC communities, but it's not talking about money going to organizations led by people of color. It's talking about money going to organizations serving people of color. So we know that if we, if we were able to track money going to organizations led by people of color, that number would be far smaller. And that is something that we would like to be able to build our capacity to do. Um, we also know that, this, that, that none of this tracks whether or not this money is being granted using a racial justice framework. Um, that's another thing that we're not able to track. So as I mentioned, we, we track our data based on the grant descriptions that funders provide to us. And that information is just not in those grant descriptions. So, but even with the, the data that we do have, we can see that there is, that there's a serious discrepancy uh, in terms of equitable distribution of resources. So um, that's one of, one of the goals of our working group is to address, uh, to address this problem as well as the issue of making sure that, that there's more funding and, and advocacy going toward racial justice work specifically. Um, I think with that, I'm going to uh, pause and I believe that Christine takes it from here. Christine, before you take over, one of the things I also want to say is, y'all, being the only non-funder in that group, there were times when I wanted to scream, and John was so patient and had me sit on my hands because I felt like this is obvious. People closest to the ground are not being funded. Uh, what's the pushback? You know, the epidemic, the numbers show us, right? And, and I really, really commend him for saying, Vanita, they can only start where they're at. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't know we would get here. Fall on the money. If you can't count it, it ain't happening. What the day, you know, so I think also what we discovered is we need to fix the holes in the data because there's a difference between funding racial justice work similar to what HIV racial justice now and funding work that is racially equitable and getting to the closer to the ground being served, getting to the people who need to be served versus organizations that are not led by folks of color serving us. And it targeting is not racial justice. And so I'm finished, Christine, over okay. you now. And I'm sorry, I just, I, that you reminded me, uh, Vanita, that, that I didn't mention that uh, as well as partnering with HIV Racial Justice Now, um, Christine, who's, who's leading our racial justice working group has also been um, helping us on, on some COVID work that we've been doing uh, and, and uh, another report that we just came out with that talks about community rooted funders and shifting money to community rooted funders. And um, so you can find, find out more about those resources on our website um, and we're happy to, to direct you to those. Christine, I'm sorry, your, your turn. Great, great, next slide, please. So after a bit of work, we, um, the, the Racial Justice Working Group of FCAA decided that one of the best ways to move forward was to, to develop a set of guiding principles that promote philanthropic anti-racist action. How we got to this place was not the most direct route possible in trying to assess what was going to have the, the best impact. But one of the things we did, did was we met with um, the philanthropic, we reviewed the report from the Philanthropic Initiative for Racial um, Equity. We met with ABFI, a, a 
coalition of black funders to really talk about where they might be able to support and provide capacity building assistance. And the other thing is that we found that this work was dovetailing with the COVID-19 learning initiative where we were trying to find out what was the impact of the quick release of funding into the community when a lot of funders eased up their funding regulations when they really um, tried to be responsive to communities, responsive not only to communities of color, but responsive in general to the, the COVID pandemic. And one of the things that we found is that a lot of small community-based organizations we're dealing with the same things that they always were dealing with in terms of lack of long-term funding, onerous reporting requirements, having no say in the direction of the funding and how those decisions were getting made. So whereas um, a lot of the funders felt they were being very responsive to the pandemic, what, what we were hearing from a lot of community-based organizations was this is the stuff we deal with all of the time and we've had to be nimble and flexible and being able to meet the needs of our communities. So in these guiding principles, what we've done, um, what FCA has done is really made a call for philanthropy to, to make anti-racist funding a priority. So all of us now know that being anti-racist is not a passive activity, it's a proactive movement to actually undo some of the historic policies and practices of the past. So you're not, we can't just say, let's make everything equal now and moving forward, everything will be fine. We also have to address the historic inequity that we've been dealing with. That we'd want philanthropy to, philanthropy to commit to these, these principles to dismantle structural racism and increase funding for racial equity. Not only do, do we want uh, funding for increased, racial equity work, but also, as John mentioned earlier, how uh, resources are allocated for services in the HIV community. And we also wanted them, wanted or calling on them to develop a set of metrics to hold themselves accountable to moving forward in this, in this direction. We had heard from many funders that they're moving forward in this direction, but as uh, Vanita and John talked about earlier, the, the data was not supporting that. So part of it is, how do you do it intentionally? Doing it with intent, with specific measures so that we can show that we are actually making progress. And one of the things that we know about metrics and doing anti-racist work, it's not, about it's not about the targets or goals or metrics being an increase in numbers. It's about changing conditions such that the numbers will increase. So really, if we're going to, dismantle the structural racism, we have to change the systems. When we change those systems, we know that more resources will be allocated to those communities and more BIPOC leaders will be supported. So the four areas that we have focused on in these guiding principles are governance, grant making practices, coordination and collaboration, and philanthropic advocacy. So first we're gonna start with governance. Next slide, please. So in the governance uh, principle, what we are calling for is um, that philanthropy commits to having BIPOC with lived experiences in positions of power. This means in, on our boards, um, as part of our staff, as part of our highly hiring practices, as part of our key organizational leadership roles. We also know that it's very important that we have people of color as part of the decision-making bodies on how resources are allocated, um, that, that they're part of our strategic planning sessions where we are deciding as community-based organizations, as we are deciding as funding organizations, what our strategic goals are, that they're part of those discussions. And then also as reflected in our human resources and program um, operations. So one of the things we are uh, to dismantle the structural racism is that we look at where the power sits and make sure that people of color, BIPOC are part of the power base in how, dis how decisions and priorities are decided and made. Next slide. 
The second principle really focuses on grant making practices and um, capacity building. So here, one of the things that we know is that one year grants do not necessarily dismantle some of the structural racism. Plans need to be made for multi-year funding where we are focusing on biped, BIPOC-led communities and community-based organizations. This is, um, this is key to us being able to be successful. When you're building strategies, very, very rarely do you have develop, implement, and have the impact you want in one year. We know that system change is a multi-year and, and the devotion of resources needs to be multi-year in structure. The next piece is really about employing participatory grant making. And when we mean say participatory grant making, this is not about developing advisory boards that provide feedback. This is about from start to finish, soup to nuts, people of color are part of identifying what the priorities are, that they're a part of the grant, the RFP writing process. They are a part of managing the process of, of how decisions are, are um, al allocated, that you're part of the criteria, they're, that there's support for intermediary funders who are much better positioned to respond flexibly and quickly to the needs of uh, BIPOC communities and really identify and advance alternative metrics and measures of success and impact of the work being done in communities using both quantitative and qualitative information to measure impact. We know, and I'm especially in the black community, that storytelling, that the oral history is as impactful as some of the quantitative data. So we need to find a way to combine those strategies as we're looking at what does success look like. Many of us who have done this work and have looked at how funding is allocated, we know of phenomenal organizations on the ground who can tell their story um, orally, but trying to write their reports in a way that funders are requiring them is, does not provide an accurate reflection of the work that they're doing. So we need to look at other ways of measuring success. Um, so the other thing is really using and seeking advice on funding pri priorities from BIPOC-led organizations. Uh, you know, um, anytime there is a decision being made about BIPOC communities, what we are calling for is that people, that BIPOC people are not just at the table, but they have some of the power to direct the resources. So it's um, really integrating that into our, our grant making processes. In addition, we know that we have to be able to support leaders of color. That So there's a need for capacity building so that our organizations are sustainable. There's a need for executive coaching so that our leaders can manage in a culturally in a way that mirrors their culture, but also allows them to be able to succeed. If we move faster than the larger white dominant culture moves, we don't want them to be left out in the cold because that we've moved in a different direction. I be able to identify and establish a pipeline with placement opportunities for BIPOC leaders. Again, this goes to the historic um, inequities that need to be be addressed that there have been so many positions of leadership led by, by white folks that we now have to proactively move to ensure some of these positions are led by, by people of color. And then again, like I said, support all phases of building sustainable organizations. Make sure that they have the planning ability, the fundraising ability, the money management ability, the ability to live the values in how they are providing services in their community. The next um, principle really talks about coordination and collaboration. We do not do this alone and the HIV community has known for <laughs> decades now that our work intersects with so many other sectors and for us to be successful, we have to coordinate and collaborate and how resources are allocated throughout our community. So the 
first part of this principle is working with public and private funders to coordinate resources to promote comprehensive systemic resource allocation, promote racial equity across the HIV service, uh, service delivery system. So what we know is that right now the public and private funding systems are not working together so that what isn't being provided in the public is being picked up um, by the private. All of us get our priorities in our heads as to what should happen, and we don't necessarily move to coordinate some of those efforts. So the other thing is that we know that we need to work across sectors that touch the HIV community to provoke, promote a seamless access to care, treatment, prevention, and supportive services. So this means looking at people, at groups that do humanitarian aid, housing, environmental work, medical, mental health, racial justice, gender equity, public health, public safety, human rights, social justice, health equity, reproductive justice, immigrant rights, workforce development. We have to look across all of those sectors because our people, people in the HIV community cross all of those sectors. Our work is intersectional in nature and the funding resources need to match that accordingly. And then the fourth uh, principle is around philanthropic advocacy. What we are calling for philanthropy to, to do is to use their power and influence um, <clears throat> as, as funders and media and as funders and intermediaries to lift up the voice um, the, of the long of the work that BIPEC led communities and community-based organizations are doing to connect communities and commu uh, community-based organizations to national, state, and local policymakers. The, the funding entities tend to have real power and access to the policy makers and decision makers. So how can they use that, that space to be allies and open doors for some BIPOC leaders? Highlight the disparities in funding for BIPOC communities, particularly for those of the, um, those intersectional communities, gay, bisexual, um, and, uh, and uh, bi bisexual and other men who have sex with men, people living with HIV, cisgender women, uh, people of trans experience, people who have experienced erratic housing, people with mental health issues, people who use drugs, sex workers, all of these things are intersectional. And so we have to look at how the resources are allocated to move in an intersectional way. Uh, we are what we are calling for our philanthropy to use their voice to elevate social and racial justice approaches. How can they change the way they are using their philanthropy dollars and resources and strategies and have that be done in a racial justice way? The other piece is to really ensure that racial justice remains a priority to funders. Um, and that they're committed to moving in an anti-racist fashion. And so we, we know that there needs to be a um, industry work group made up of individuals and organizations from the most impacted communities to continue to provide feedback and recommendations on how they're doing. So a constant feedback loop needs to be established. And to listen to what is needed on the ground from people on the ground and how they will critically reflect on how to work better in service of the communities that they serve. So these are the <clears throat> four principles of uh, that we've come up with for the racial from the racial justice and HIV philanthropy, and we are really calling on philanthropy to commit to moving forward in this in this direction. And one of the things that we know that uh, many people do is they respond to community the community call for moving forward. So I'm gonna to toss this back to Vanita on how we can move forward and how we can have our voice elevated to philanthropy as we put forward the, these guiding principles. Uh, thank you, Christine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Y'all, That's I think Christine did that in maybe 15 minutes or so. We have been meeting since the fall of 2020. Okay, and, and that's not to say you can put a timeline on this, but 
for those of y'all who've been in this fight and I've been you know, dealing with this, uh, that sounds like a drop in the bucket, but it is long past due. And uh, I, like I said, I commend Christine, John and his staff, but the question that started this with, with John is I called up John one day after we had been there, uh, Larry Scott Walker, Marco, I think Cecilia, Charles Stephen, we had, we had spoke. I was offended that we were asked to speak on election day and John said he'd never do that again. And he didn't because they held a summit. This was midterms, y'all. Y'all know where we needed to be. But I asked him, what was different? What were they doing different after we keep coming there speaking? And he, he got quiet and he, and I asked even the audience, I think, and the audience went quiet. And I called John up and said that, and John said, we will do something. And we began going to conferences. They've been supporting us to get in front of funders. And, and John said, we need, we could start this racial justice work group. And now is today, we are here. And so what we, you know, John has kept his word to us in terms of, you know, working with HIV racial justice now, Marco and I championed this with the rest of the steering committee. And I, I, those of you who are on this call, I commend you. And now it's time we need others. We need the help of the rest of the community. What I would like us to make these guiding principles sound loud as a cannon, right? And what that means is these, these principles are gonna be circulated. We want you to circulate. We want signatures. We want we want this to reach across the country, across the globe with signatures of individuals and organizations. Funders were at the table when we developed this, right? But it was a handful of funders. We need them to know that the community says yes to this, that business as usual is no more. I, now that I'm in a position of finding funding uh, and, and running an organization with my uh, partner in crime, Nana, Multi-year funding is essential for a uh, small organization. You just spend half your time keeping the lights on. You cannot do the work of the mission. And so we want you all to look out. If you signed up for this, you're going to get these uh, principles uh, by email with a sign-on feature. And we want your signature. We want the signature of others. Now is the time. We have not arrived yet. We've come a long way, y'all but we still got a ways to go there. Um, these these uh, guiding principles will be circulated by y'all and I'm asking y'all to really get these out. Secondly, uh, the, the upcoming Funders Concerned About AIDS Summit, that's November 8th and 9th, there's gonna be a session there for funders going over these principles as well. And you know, so we welcome your feed. Well, we got to stop the feedback because I keep saying feedback because I'm an engagement person. But we need your signatures because we've got to start somewhere. We've got to ask folks to be accountable. We've got to demand accountability. So that's what's going to happen next. Uh, we might have some time in uh, for a few questions here. But again, we've come a long way. I think we started this journey. So when I say midterms, it started in 2018 then because mm -hmm. that's when you when we were in midterms. I, I probably called John later that year, early 2019, and we spent time getting in front of funders. And then in 2020, John kept his word and we now have a racial justice working group. Now we need community to let them know it is not just a few folks that is tired of business as usual. We need others to also sign on and help us make this a practice, make these guiding principles the standard or more. And so I, I, I if I could plead and I, I'm, I'm ready to show out, throw out Marco's name, you know, uh, uh, we had <laughs> organized this workshop, y'all. Let me tell y'all how Marco came to me and we didn't have, we didn't have Jose on doing Spanish interpretation. And um, the other night, Marco scared the mess out of me. It wasn't scary, but it was like, whoa, how did, I, how did we plan a webinar without having someone doing translation? So Marco is live and well. If you love Marco, if you believe in what he talked about, please help us make this a reality. Immigration is a racial justice issue. Language justice is a racial justice issue. If you don't know what it means, we need, we need folks to be funded to educate our community, provide technical assistance, and we need funding that uses a racial justice lens in the way that it does its work. So 
I thank you all. I'm going to turn this back over to um, Dion uh, or John for last words because I can get really emotional because when Marco wanted us to write about this blog about it, I mean, so many ways. And now he isn't here and we are here and we have a duty to carry this on for him. So I thank you all for joining. You will get, because your email, you sign up your email, y'all, you will get the, um, the guiding principles with the sign-on feature after this webinar. Again, circulate, act like your life depend on this because there are so many who does. They say we can end the epidemic, and I'm sorry, you can't end the epidemic without money. You cannot end the epidemic without funding the people critical to the work. You cannot end the epidemic without funding people who know what needs to be done on the ground. Funding people who don't look like me to serve me will not end the epidemic. So um, I thank you all for joining us. Um, um, and I'll turn this back on over to- um, You might yeah. drop like that and then you're gonna give it to me. You see how, look, see, but now you all see why it's amazing to work with there. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to open up for a question and answer. You can either chime in directly if you wanna come off mute um, or uh, I can also unmute you if you wanna raise your hand or you can feel free to put any questions in the chat. Um, thank you all for the understanding and flexibility uh, regarding the slides. Um, genuinely have no idea what's going on with my mouse. Um, so yeah, please, 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 any and all questions because we wanted this to, to kind of yield feedback from various people in the community, whether you're a stakeholder, a funder, um, someone engaged in HIV delivery, um, please, 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 any questions. And I know folks that, those of us that work in HIV advocacy are not shy, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> there's no way y'all gonna convince me of that one. I'm seeing some comments, Mike Webb, this was amazing. Tana, this was amazing. Thank you, Stephen. You just hold on, this, this is past due. Um, heck yeah, the things that they could do under COVID, why can't they do that all the time? Right. right. And, and also just a, a um, kind of those of you that signed up when you register for the webinar, you also were able to select if you wanted additional information about about HIV racial justice now HRJN. And so those of you will also be kind of receiving updates related to the work we're doing in the field, um, kind of current initiatives that we're taking on um, and that sort of thing. So you can always um, feel free to email us um, as well. But I do want to see if there's any questions because there's no way. We're good, but we're not that good. No way. <laughs> <laughs> How do we sign on? So the sign on is going to be, I will send, um, well, HIV racial justice will going to be sending from that email to the email that you signed up to the, to the Zoom meeting with. Um, and we're going to use that compile a list and then we're going to circulate it once it's confirmed. And that should be after um, FCAA summit, which their summit is the second or first weekend of November, the 8th and the 9th, I believe. So hopefully we can get it circulated uh, kind of shortly before Thanksgiving. The other thing is, I, is that we are still open to feedback as you were, are hearing this and, you're, and, you're, and there, you have any questions or, you, or you're thinking, why didn't you add this component? Feel free to reach out to us we are more than happy to consider those pieces. Um, this is, has been a very collaborative process, you know, which is, is, is kind of the way that we uh, dismantle some racism is that you have to open the doors for communication, dialogue, debate, open, passionate debate to get to where we want to be. Any, any lingering questions or I would, Danita or John, would you all want to kind of do any last things that you feel like, or Steven, I said, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, okay, yeah. go right ahead. I'm washing dishes and separating laundry at the same time. So that's okay, just, that's okay. My hands are wet, so I'm not gonna type on my phone with the question. I'm just gonna ask. So I did ask a question about how we sign on. Thank you for that answer. I guess I gotta wait for that email for one. Also, when it comes to spreading this to other groups, for instance, folks that are working on the ending HIV epidemic plans, how, when it comes to getting them to sign on as well, you got to share information, but I need some direction on how to direct them to sign on. Okay. So, Thanks. 
I'm listening, watching on my TV and watching and doing producing my dishes. Go ahead. That's okay. Listen, we're all we all multitask these days in the COVID world for sure. So it's it's understand. Um, Vanita or John, would you all want to uh, give an answer on that? Because I because the I, I plan on submitting when we circulate it, it will be uh, an electronic signature, right? So people will have links as well as a PDF version of the document that you can feel free. We would love for you to circulate that and publicize that out to any and all people you feel um, it impacts and any and all people you feel that would be motivated or kind of inspired by the information. Um, yeah, so that's my answer and I'll turn it to anyone else of the presenters or speakers to chime in as well. Thanks, Dion. I, I just wanted to, to say that um, this was our, our first preview of the principles. Um, our second preview is going to be with funders. As Dion mentioned, we've got our summit coming up on the 8th and the 9th, and Christine's going to be moderating a session that Benita is going to be part of, where we're going to be sharing this with funders. And after that, we'll be re releasing them publicly. And that's when um, we're asking folks to feel free and share them wherever they want, far and wide, and we'll, we'll be doing the same. Uh, my colleague Sarah is on the call with me. She's our communications director, and um, we'll be working together to strategize lots of ways to, to share these far and wide. So and we appreciate any help. Yeah, and Stephen, what I would say, if they are approaching this from a philanthropy standpoint to get in on the conversation with other funders, that they could reach out to John and his team. If they are talking about partnering with community and our role in this and uh, how we see this, any advice and feedback we could give them, that please reach out to HIV Racial Justice Now. I mean, you could do either one or the other. I don't want them to be limited that would they rather talk to if they're coming from a funder perspective or are they coming from a community perspective? Because this stuff is integral to ending the epidemic. People keep telling me, and if some another person tell me the high numbers of money we got, but yet I don't see the numbers down in new cases of HIV. I don't see anything change. We know this, this kind of these guiding principles could change the game with the way that the, the, we are, the way that we respond to HIV. And so I, I invite them either one or both. Got it. Okay. And that's something I can do and I can wait on that for sure. So thank y'all. Um, one thing I do think it's important to say in the communications with other funders and other organizations as well is principally what we saw with COVID, what I put in the chat, what we saw with COVID did not need to happen, ha did not need to happen. In March of 2020, this was predicted that it was going to happen, that it was going to be people of color that are going to be adversely affected. And at that point also was when some of the pull back on some of the steps to provide more protection for people were occurred as well. Right at that point, we started discerning that people of color are going to be impacted. A ramp up should happen with protection. It pulled back at exactly the wrong time. So what happened with COVID did not need to happen. The lessons were there with HIV. We are very familiar with that. Anyone that's worked with HIV and to allow them to repeat again to affect people of color the way it did with COVID is not acceptable. And to allow it to occur again beyond COVID is more than not acceptable. That is um, negligence, essentially, from my perspective. And so we need to make sure that this gets out and that message is heard, that the lessons are learned with HIV. We did not apply them with COVID. We need to apply these lessons to prevent it from happening again. That's essentially it. And if we don't, it's the failure of public health and whoever is guiding some of the work that needs to be done. Thank you, Stephen. You know I believe in everything you just said. That's why it's time to demand the change. Let's stop playing games with folks who, and you know, they might be well-intentioned about any epidemic, but it's still business as usual on status quo. So yeah. it's and it hasn't ended it. That proves that their strategy is not working. Time to start listening to other folks. Absolutely. Um, and, and actually what I'm going to do, if, if there's questions or if there's things that people kind of ideas that pop up in between now and when the document is circulated. So what I will do is put our HRJN HIV racial justice at gmail.com in the chat. Some of you may have seen it, but depending on how you heard about the event, you may not have 
gotten access to that email. The other thing I would say is while people wait for this document to be circulated, if you've not been able to read the declaration, that also is a great document that could at least get a conversation started and to get people thinking about what more racial, racially just and racially equitable funding looks like. Uh, and I'm gonna actually put that in the chat as well. Um, and it's also available online, but I also wanted to give people kind of immediate, easy access. Um, and I will put our email here as well. There we go. Um, yes. Gilbert, could you say what you mean? Could the two could also include internal uh, organizational advocacy? Just want to make sure I understand you. Uh, just, hi, everyone. Um, just something that's also going to assist whenever we are moving from, I guess, how an organization has been structured to a more racially just uh, framework. Yeah. So yes, this is great, but also there are things that are so ingrained in a 30 year long, I guess, standing yeah. organization that does need to be changed. You are so right. So there's a few things in the making. I've been working with me and Stephen, uh, Houston, Harris County, and, and, and I've started talking racial justice in the epi in an epidemic in 2016. This year, Stephen, because he's so nice, he got them to say, hey, let's do it. So they said to me, Vanita, just show us how to make our services more racially just. Nobody expected the conversation about hiring, who's making those decisions looking inside so you're exactly right and we understand that but to it needs you you need to look at the full spectrum so there's work being done by AH united and their public policy council where we have a racial uh, index racial justice index committee who's coming up with an instrument so organizations at least the 60 ppc organizations have said they will use on themselves to kind of you know, really evaluate internal and external. And then the goal is down the line to be able to provide TA for organizations to get in line. So that's happening on a federal level. It's in process, which will take a while, but you're exactly right. You, you can't just, there's not a quick fix to fix this widget and it will all work. So that's why we talk about systemic and structural and, and philanthropy is just one piece that hiring, who does the hiring? What does the org chart look like? Who are the decision makers? All, all the things that are needed. And, and hopefully what HIV racial justice now would like to be is that we move forward, we can become a political home and support leaders of color who are inside these organizations and dealing with this, that change is gonna take a minute, right? Because nobody you know, is changing overnight. And so any ideas or suggestions, we are looking to make them to support that change. Philanthropy is just one piece of it. So you're exactly right, 30 year, HIV Inc. professionalization of HIV has got folks ingrained in doing it one way and, and maintaining power. So I did want, before we jump to the, another Thank question, you. and I wanna be respectful of folks' time is Gilbert, I wanna make sure, cause V, I don't know if you're able to see, cause Sarah mentioned this in the chat. Um, and so I wanted to give Sarah the opportunity to also um, comment um, in terms of the toolkit or if, if you kind of had any, Anything you wanted to add to that, Sarah? Because I know you brought it up in the chat and just wanted to give you the floor. Yeah, thank you. And hi, everybody. Uh, I What we'll probably be doing is once we're getting ready to launch, we'll do a social media toolkit and we'll give lots of people content and shareables and things that you can kind of easily help to get the, the principles out there and, and share with your partners. But I think what's important and we haven't noted noted yet, part of the principle sharing will also be to collect a number of resources and tools to help build different pieces of this puzzle, both capacity for funders and others. So we will be starting to collect things, which is also another piece of this. So if you have seen something out there or you've used something with a funder or in your own organization that you think would be useful to help some of this movement, um, be free, you know, feel free to reach out and share it with us too so we can kind of start building these resources as well. And, and please know that that is also true on our side of HIV racial justice now. We're really trying to be a, a place that resources can be housed where it's data-driven approaches to, to this issue, 
Um, and so, yeah, that's another reason why we wanted to compile emails is because we wholeheartedly know that there's power in community, there's power in knowledge and information sharing. And we also know that for so many of us, um, we had to learn this the hard way uh, through trial and error. And any way we can push that needle forward or help others push that needle forward, uh, we wholeheartedly see that as our, our job and with, well within our capacity as well. Um, I did want to ask if there's any other questions. I do wanna be respectful of time, but this is a, a incredibly important conversation. Um, I thought I saw one other person come off the mute. Maybe not. Um, okay, uh-oh, did I hear? Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, I will say genuinely um, thank you all for coming. I know that we are all on Zoom nonstop. We could probably change our names to Zoom and it would be easier. Um, so thank you for, for taking the time to uh, come to this incredibly important webinar. Um, and I will turn it over to the others if for any last lingering thoughts on my end, genuinely thank you. I truly hope that you can take this conversation and use it as a catalyst for others um, even before the principles get to you, uh, that doesn't stop the conversation from happening. So plant that seed now and then come back to the principles and other resources later, uh, because we all know that this is going to be a long haul and that we're going to all have to kind of persuade and push from various angles. Um, and as my grandma raised me to always say, teamwork makes the dream work. So thank you all so much. Um, and from HRJN and from FCAA. Um, thank you, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.